So I want to welcome everybody. For those of you who are looking and thinking, I must be Dave Meyer. Uh, I'm not. I'm Mike Fitz. But I am a member of the, uh, this illustrious law faculty. And I knew I was in the law school when I looked up and realized everybody's sitting in the back. Um, but we promise uh, we, won't be, uh, we won't be calling on anybody today. Um, I, this is, I'm, Dave, Dave Meyer is going to do the official introduction, but I really wanted to take a moment and sort of set the table of what an incredible person Ken Feinberg is and what, what you're about to hear and what a treat it is. Um, he is, and I, I, I never use this term lightly, one of a kind. There's nobody like him, I think, uh, in the United States, and if he didn't exist, we'd have to invent him. Uh, he, you know, we obviously, um, he's somebody who, Ken is, I've known Ken for a number of years, and he is sort of the quintessential uh, uh, lawyer um, extraordinary in so many ways. Now, again, Dave's going to go through and he's going to talk about um, sort of the 9-11 and what he did in 9-11, and he's going to talk about Virginia Tech and the BP oil spill. Um, the fact of the matter is uh, Ken Feinberg has been involved in some of the most significant uh, issues in the legal profession over the last 10, 15 years uh, in every way. Um, and he's been called on by presidents, Republican and Democrat, to really when, when the sort of the most fundamental uh, problems in mass torts had to be uh, um, addressed, um, he, was, he was on their, on their speed dial. But I want to talk just very briefly, and I'll, I'll turn it over to Dave, about the qualities that make him that, that type of individual. Um, Ken has a, a, what I would call um, practical wisdom. Uh, and there was a great book written by uh, Tony Cronman um, at Yale called The Lost Lawyer, and thinking back about the, the old uh, qualities that made a great lawyer, the sort of the thoughtfulness, the analytic, and the ability to deal with people. Well, I think of Ken as the modern uh, lost lawyer. He is, he is the modern equivalent of this individual who has incredible intelligence and analytic ability to deal with problems that really are intractable facing our society, but he's also got all those qualities of emotional intelligence, ability to think through problems pragmatically, and that's how you get somebody who is able to take on these issues that nobody's ever seen before involve literally um, thousands of individuals with claims, and to work them through in a, in a way that is 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 fundamental, um, and, uh, and and really we we all owe a great great deal of credit. I got to know Ken before he was Ken Feinberg. Um, he was uh, this was literally he was teaching evidence um, at uh, the University of Pennsylvania Law School at the time of 9/11. And I remember him as, you know, an incredible evidence teacher, an incredible skilled trial lawyer, um, the person I would take um, for, for classes and I would emulate um, in teaching. Um, and it's it, it, since then when he was sort of called to take over uh, the issues in 9-11 that you've seen those skills as a mediator and a skilled litigator and teacher extraordinary dealing with the political issues of these problems uh, and the, the, the complexity of legal issues um, as well as just the pragmatics of dealing in, in large numbers. Uh, and that in a sense is why I think of him as the modern uh, lawyer, the, the sort of the practical wisdom, the person who has it all. One final quick note um, public service. He's done all of, uh, of these at personal sacrifice to himself uh, and his career. He's done it for uh, the community in so many different cases. So in that sense, he epitomizes everything I think of when I think of Tulane and Tulane Law School. Somebody who's committed uh, to his community but has intelligence and at the same time all those personal qualities that truly uh, define the great lawyer. So it is, it is um, I'm, I'm not going to spend any more time uh, telling you how much I admire him and how much I think he's done uh, not only for this region, uh, for this country, but I also think, think he epitomizes our ideal 
of, of what a modern lawyer is about. So with that, I want to um, thank all of you for coming, and I will now turn it over uh, to Dave Meyer. Thanks. Thanks very much, uh, Mike, and, and it's my great pleasure also to join in welcoming you to uh, this very special lecture by uh, Kenneth Feinberg. I can hardly do better uh, than that introduction uh, in, uh, in presenting our speaker, uh, but I think it's fair to say, as uh, President Fitz has uh, suggested, I think, that, uh, that there is no attorney uh, who has surpassed uh, Ken Feinberg. Uh, both in terms of his contributions to uh, real innovation in the legal system uh, over the past uh, two decades and in terms of his personal uh, service to the nation in times of crisis. Uh, Ken Feinberg had already built a very full and quite spectacular uh, legal career uh, in, uh, uh, before uh, he became Ken Feinberg, uh, before he became uh, established what has really made him most famous. Uh, today, uh, a graduate of the University of Massachusetts uh, at Amherst and NYU uh, Law School, Mr. Feinberg immediately launched a high-flying uh, career in public service, first as a law clerk uh, at the New York Court of Appeals, New York's highest court uh, for Judge Stanley Fold, uh, and then as an assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York in Manhattan, uh, and uh, finally as a top aide and chief of staff to U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy. Uh, he only then uh, entered private practice uh, to help found the D.C. office of uh, the New York-based Kay Scholler uh, firm uh, before ultimately uh, founding his own firm, uh, Feinberg Rosen, in 1993 and building a reputation as one of the nation's uh, finest and most influential uh, uh, attorneys, lawyers, uh, and uh, mediators. Uh, for at least the past two decades, uh, Mr. Feinberg, uh, as you know, has been the nation's go-to uh, czar for resolving uh, the nation's naughtiest and most sensitive legal claims arising from uh, disaster and uh, mass injury. Uh, he's been appointed, uh, as, uh, as President Fitz mentioned, by a succession of presidents, governors, attorneys general, uh, courts uh, to design and manage legal response uh, to injury claims arising from everything from the September 11th uh, terrorist attacks uh, to Hurricane Katrina and the BP oil spill uh, to the mass killings at Virginia Tech, the Aurora, Colorado um, movie theater, uh, and Sandy Hook Elementary uh, School, to name only a few. As special master for the 9-11 uh, Victims Relief Fund, uh, he had the unenvi unenviable task of personally presiding over uh, more than 900 of the 1,600 uh, hearings uh, in which family members of victims uh, of that tragedy uh, uh, sought uh, compensation crafted to the uh, personal circumstances of their loss. Uh, he's also been called upon uh, through his career to uh, value the uh, uh, the the value of the Zabruder film of the Kennedy uh, assassination uh, and to navigate compensation claims for victims of uh, uh, everything from Holocaust slave labor to the marathon, uh, the uh, Boston uh, marathon bombings and human radiation experiments. Uh, Esquire magazine uh, called Mr. Feinberg the nation's leading expert on picking up the pieces and the ABA journal has rightly suggested that he uh, has become a brand unto himself, uh, once unique and ubiquitous as the nation's problem solver. Uh, much of it, as President Fitz mentioned, including the, uh, the September 11th uh, compensation work, which spanned years, uh, uh, he has done pro bono uh, as a service to uh, others and to the nation. At every turn, his approach uh, to addressing mass injury has often been really strikingly innovative, uh, creating from whole cloth distinct alternatives uh, to traditional legal mechanisms for establishing liability and compensation. Uh, so we are tremendously honored to welcome uh, Kenneth Feinberg back to Tulane Law School, uh, where he has previously uh, delivered uh, endowed lectures here. Uh, we're really thrilled to have him back to address unconventional responses to unique catastrophes tailoring the law to meet the challenges. Uh, and we're also uh, delighted to be able to welcome 
Mr. Feinberg's wife, Aditi Feinberg, uh, to join us as well. So thank you so much. Well, I want to <clears throat> I want to thank uh, the dean. You know, here's the problem: when you come to a law school, all right, 15 minutes of the one hour <laughs> is devoted to introductions. So you already killed 25 percent. You give law school and university administrators a mic, off they go. That's just a rule, and there's nothing you can do about it except thank them um, vociferously for uh, those gracious words. I'm really here. I'm really here today for three reasons. First, to once again meet my old friend, uh, President Fitz. One of, the, one of the great law school deans in the history of this country, I'm telling you. Uh, uh, he invited me to teach at Penn, and I took him up on it. And uh, uh, Tulane is certainly uh, very fortunate to have Mike Fitz here uh, at this great university. Dean Meyer, obviously, I thank for the great work that he's doing. And, of course, Ed Sherman is here, a legend in the bar somebody who's available at all times to comment the conscience of some of these major cases that I've worked on. And there are some students here. Alex Johnson is here somewhere who worked for Senator Landrew during my administration of the Gulf Coast Claims Facility and the BP oil spill. So one reason I'm here is to, th to say thank you to the current dean and some old friends. The second reason I'm here is this city uh, has in it friends that every time I come to New Orleans or Louisiana, I want to see for all of the good things they do. Bill Goldring's here, a friend of this university. Julie Oreck is here, who does so much for the community, charitable causes. The chance to just return to this area, very important to me. And the third and maybe most important reason is the opportunity to return to this great national recognized law school. Tulane stands uh, at the pinnacle, probably the greatest law school in this area, the Gulf region, and one of the great law schools in the United States committed to public service and trying to train lawyers to give back to the community. So I've been here at Tulane on Katrina. I've been here at Tulane to discuss BP oil spill. And I'm back here today to sort of summarize uh, some of the work I've done and how it relates to the law and to lawyers. So that's sort of a, instead of a 15 minute introduction, that's a five minute summary of why I'm here. Now. We can go right away to chapter 7, because this is Tulane. It's not just the general public. This is a rather sophisticated crowd. Every once in a while in American life, not often, there is a tragedy. And the tragedy so galvanizes the American people, triggers an emotional national response that policymakers, judges, Congress, presidents, governors, mayors, attorneys general, they decide that for this particular tragedy, we want to compensate innocent victims outside of the conventional system that we do this. We want to create commensurate with the nature of the tragedy, a special program only for those victims to compensate. This is very, very rare, and it should be very rare. 9-11. 9-11, 13 days after 9-11, Congress passed a law signed by President Bush. And the law simply said, anybody who doesn't want to litigate against the airlines, the World Trade Center, Massport, the Port Authority of New York, the security guard companies, Boeing, anybody who doesn't want to do that, come into a special program funded entirely by the taxpayer. 
and you'll be paid as if you litigated. Three weeks after the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico, BP walks into the White House and walks out with the president at the arm of the chairman of the board. We have decided to create a no-fault compensation system. And we at BP will front $20 billion. I mean, I had to turn up the volume to make sure I heard this right. Without even a trial on liability, we will front $20 billion. Even Goldring couldn't believe that amount of money. And, 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 and BP said, if that's not enough, we'll add to it. $20 billion. A handshake. No law. A handshake with the White House and the Department of Justice. Within a week of a congressional hearing chastising General Motors for not disclosing certain alleged defects in an ignition switch in certain GM automobiles. GM announces, we have decided to create a no-fault fund to compensate families and victims of certain GM automobile accidents, physical injury and death. And Mr. Feinberg will run that program. No limit, whatever it takes, he'll decide. Now those three programs are aberrations, you see. They are unconventional responses. I do not know of a fourth or a fifth or a sixth. Certainly not at that level of public review. They are extremely rare. Now look at the difference. Tulane gets this. The people here get this. Look at the difference between those three programs and the other half dozen or more programs that compensate innocent victims. Boston Marathon. 61 million I distributed in 60 days. Private money sent in. Donations. 100,000 donations from all over the United States. 61 million dollars. Distributed to 250 people who died or were physically injured as a result of the marathon bombings. Newtown, Connecticut, those first graders, 25 students, first graders and faculty, killed by a deranged gunman. We distributed about $8 million. Aurora, Colorado, Dark Knight, the shooting in the movie theater, we distributed about $5 million, all private money that came in. Virginia Tech, 32 students and faculty killed in a classroom smaller than this. A deranged student gunman comes in and kills them. $8 million distributed to them and their families. Now, law, notice the difference. It is critical. 9-11, BP, GM. You take money in those cases and you waive your right to go to the tort system. It is a clear alternative to the tort system. It's a separate vehicle for compensating people. And if you decide voluntarily to take that money, I hereby promise I will not sue. Well, everybody, virtually everybody takes the money. Every, uh, virtually, 9-11, 97% take the money. BP, 92% take the money. GM, so far, 100% take the money. Why not? Why not? You're not paying workers' compensation dollars. You're paying tort part of gold dollars. So why not take the money and waive your right to sue? Not, uh, Boston Marathon and all of those other cases, that's not an alternative to the tort system. That's a gift. You don't sign anything. Here's a check. Do what you want with it. You want to hire a lawyer and sue? Go ahead. Nobody does. 
I talked with Ed about this earlier today. Why don't people sue if they can when they get a check? But they don't. Though you, you've got to make this distinction, you see. There's nothing pr- uh, provocative or frankly, to my way of thinking, there's nothing problematic. If the American people want to uh, exercise charity and send in money to distribute to people, well, it's a wonderful thing. Never underestimate, never underestimate the charitable impulse of the American people. It's like nothing I've ever seen on earth. Never. A tragedy? Money pours in from people watching on cable TV. Send in a check, $10, $20, $100, $1,000. Help the people. Help, help, help. Fine. That's very different than telling people, we'll give you money if and only if you voluntarily decide I will not litigate. Now that raises some profound public policy questions, doesn't it? Now take the 9-11 fund, a wonderful example of a successful, compassionate program. I have spent the last 13 years, 12 years, vigorously defending the wisdom of that program. It was the right thing to do after 9-11. It exhibited to me the best in our character, in our history, as a compassionate people, rallying the nation as one community to help the victims. It worked. Don't ever do it again. The 9-11 Fund is best studied, not in torts, but in a history class. It's a history class, maybe a divinity class, uh, uh, or a class in psychiatry, but clearly it is a one-off You will not see the 9-11 fund again. Bad things happen to good people every day in this country, and there's no 9-11 fund. Here in New Orleans, I didn't see any 9-11 fund after Katrina. There wasn't the slightest interest. I didn't see a 9-11 fund after uh, a tornado or or a flood or an earthquake. Or an, or an airplane crash. There's no 9-11 fund. You should have read some of the emails I got when I was administering the 9-11 fund. Dear Mr. Feinberg, I don't get it. My son died in Oklahoma City. Where's my check? Dear Mr. Feinberg, would you please explain to me, my wife died in the basement of the World Trade Center in the original 1993 attack committed by the very same people. Where's my check? And it wasn't just terrorism. Dear Mr. Feinberg, there's an injustice here. Last year, my wife saved three little girls from drowning in the Mississippi River, and then she drowned a heroin. Where's my check? You better be careful when you decide that it's appropriate to take public taxpayer money only for these victims. Everybody else, fend for yourself. But for these victims, we are so upset will pay compensation out of the taxpayer dollar treasury department. Now, I think it was the right thing to do. But it raises profound philosophic questions about compensating very easily and quickly only certain victims. So be careful about using the 9-11 fund as some sort of wave of the future. It's a wave of nothing. It's a precedent for nothing. It is a one-off aberration that ought to be studied with thanks. It worked. Don't do it again. BP was different. The problem we had with BP, that's, that's BP's money. Now, I don't think you'll ever see a BP fund again either. Maybe, maybe, I know of no company before or after 
that has fronted $20 billion as a down payment and has said, if that's not enough, we'll pay more. $20 billion? When I heard that number, and I was asked to do this by the president and by BP, I said, there's no $20 billion. I mean, how is it possible to distribute to fishermen and oyster harvesters and shrimpers and seaboat captains and hotels? How is it possible to spend $20 billion? And in 16 months, we distributed $6.5 billion and achieved or received 220,000 releases. I will not sue. It worked! Now, we received in BP 1,200,000 claims from 50 states. I got 20 claims from Alaska. I didn't know the oil got as far as Alaska. We got about 300 claims in Maryland, 400 in New York State, including upstate New York. Interesting, from Syracuse. Build it and they will come. You build a program and announce, we'll look at any claim related to the spill. They all come in. 35 foreign countries. We're getting claims from Sweden, Norway. I mean, a million two hundred thousand claims. We had, at one point, about 4,000 people working for us, including Alex, working for Senator Landrieu, trying to process these claims. Now, we did it. In six months, we paid the claims. As one commentator noted, 92% of all the estimated claims were paid by the Gulf Coast Claims Facility. We rejected two-thirds of the claims as ineligible and either ineligible or lacking proof. Mr. Feinberg, I lost a hundred thousand dollars. I couldn't fish. They closed the fishing grounds. Okay. Uh, prove it. What do you mean? We do things with a handshake down here in the Gulf. Oh, no. If you're going to file a claim for $100,000, show me the proof. Do you have a tax return? No. Do you have a pro, uh, some corporate statement, profit and loss statement? Yes, here. Here it is. And he gives us something in crayon. But, you know, you go through it. All right. All right. We're going to send you a check in 30 days for Gulf Coast Claims Facility for $100,000. Now, with it... In the envelope, you're going to get a 1099 from the IRS. He looks at me. I am? Yeah. I wave it. You can't wave a 1099. I, I'm obligated to send you the 1099. Yeah? Yeah. I withdraw my claim. You mean you're giving up $100,000 because you're going to get a 1099? Yeah. Rip it up. Probably never paid taxes in his life. Ripped it up. So that's the problem we had with BP. Now maybe it'll be, it's an unconventional response to a unique catastrophe. Maybe we'll see that again. But $20 billion, I mean, that is uh, summa cum laude. That, that, I have never seen anything quite like that. GM, GM basically just says, still, we're still doing GM claims. Whatever it costs. We're backing off. Feinberg will do it. We'll abide by his judgment, and he'll, he'll authorize payment. Well, GM concluded 13 deaths attributable to the switch, the ignition switch defect. They examined the automobiles and found direct evidence of switch failure. We're not doing direct evidence. We're, we're right out of tort one at Tulane. Was the switch the proximate cause of the accident? Sounds like a final exam to me in a couple of weeks. That's a final exam question, right? Was the switch in an automobile, most of which are over 10 years old, the accident? Was the switch the proximate cause of the accident? Well, it's, an, it's a circumstantial evidence case. It's not a direct evidence case. Let's look at the police report. Did the airbag deploy? If the airbag deployed, the switch was on. The power was on. The switch didn't fail. 
you're ineligible. The airbag didn't deploy. Okay, let's look at the photos of the accident. If it's a rear end collision or a side collision, maybe the airbag shouldn't deploy. But if it's a front end collision where the car hit a tree going 50 and the airbag didn't deploy, pay the claim. And let's look at maintenance records and let's look at insurance investigate. Just what you study at torts. It's right out of torts. If somebody says to you, what does this really mean, tort one? Why do I need to study it other than to pass the bar? Is that right? Torts drives these three programs, 9-11, BP, and GM. It's tort law. It's a different mechanism and a different avenue for paying claims. But it's tort. It's tort related. That's how these programs work. Now, what's the toughest part of these programs? Is it designing the program? No. Do you need a law degree to do what I do? No. I think a law degree helps. A law degree is probably, in what I do these days, is probably a wash. It doesn't hurt, but I'm not sure it's critical. Better a divinity degree or a degree in psychiatry because... The hardest part of what I do in any one of these cases, whether it's an alternative to the tort system or a gift, the hardest part, as the dean pointed out, by far, are the individual hearings that you invite for any claimant, any family member who wants to come and see me privately and in confidence to talk about a claim. And here's the fascinating thing. Virtually nobody comes to see me to talk about money or what they ought to get. Never. One in a hundred. They come for one of two reasons every time. One, to vent to vent about life's unfairness. Mr. Feinberg, my daughter, eight weeks ago, graduated William and Mary Law School. Washington and Lee. Graduated Washington and Lee Law School. She had a job that she was about to start as a first year associate at a law firm in Richmond. And she's dead because of GM's defective switch. Where is the justice, Mr. Feinberg? There is no God. No God could allow this to happen. I will never set foot in a church again. We Better me than my daughter. And I'm here to tell you that it is, it is impossible for me to understand how something like this can happen. And you listen. What can you say? What can you say? That, 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 Mr. Feinberg, it's, it's a 9-11 hearing. 24-year-old woman comes to see me. Mr. Feinberg, I lost my husband. He was a fireman at the World Trade Center. And he left me with our two children, six and four. Now you're going to give me three million dollars. I want it in 30 days. 30 days? Mrs. Jones, I've got to go to Treasury. It's public money. They've got to do their due diligence. They've got to cut the check. Why do you need the check in 30 days? Why? I'll tell you why. My husband left me with these two children. But I have terminal cancer. I have 10 weeks to live. My husband was going to survive me and take care of these two kids. Now they're going to be orphans. I must get this money immediately while I still have my faculties to set up a trust to help my children. I'm going to be gone. We accelerated the money. Eight weeks later, she died. Now, it, it, that is the part of this, you see that tells you when you take on one of these assignments, no matter who asks you to do it, brace yourself. 
brace yourself for what you're going to hear. It is astounding to me. People come in. They also come to see me, not to vent, but to validate the memory of a lost loved one. Mr. Feinberg, I was married for 25 years. I lost my wife at the World Trade Center. We were married for 25 years. And I want to use this hearing to show you a video of our wedding 25 years ago. Mr. Jones, you don't have to show me that video. It'll be very emotional and it won't have any bearing on compensation. And I would recommend... You're going to watch. I want you to see what those murderers did to my angel. My office in the 9-11 fund was filled with memorabilia. Videos, medals, ribbons, diplomas, certificates of good conduct, green cards. Everything under the sun. Photograph albums where the claimant says, Mr. Feinberg, I want to go through the 28 pages. I want you to see when we were married, and now this and that. And what do you do? You listen. You listen. There is very, very little you can say to people who want to be heard. And giving them that opportunity is critical to the credibility of the program. So you give them that opportunity. I was skeptical 20 years ago about the value of these hearings, these one-on-one -on -one hearings. They slow the process down. You're trying to get money out with speed and efficiency and certainty. And do you want to really delay giving people an opportunity? Well, you've got to give people that chance. It's not only the right thing to do, it helps the program's credibility. They leave and tell their neighbor, Feinberg's listening. It helps. So it takes a bit longer. But there's very little you can do. You're not a magician. You're not a, a, you, you, you better just be quiet and let people say what they want to say. After the Boston Marathon bombings, I get a call from a claimant. Mr. Feinberg, I can't come and see you because at the marathon I lost my leg and I'm still undergoing rehab at the hospital in Boston. That's all right, Mr. Jones, I'll come and see you. So I go over to the hospital. I go into his room, a hospital room at the hospital. There he is lying on a bed with a stump where his leg used to be. Just an open stump. It's right there. On his lap is his nine-year-old son. And around the table, his wife, his mother, and his brother. Mr. Jones, I'm here to tell you that One Fund Boston is going to give you a check tax-free for $1,125,000. He looks at me. You're going to give me a check for $1,125,000? Yes. I got a better idea, Feinberg. I got a better idea. You keep the check. Give me my leg back. How's that? How's that for a trade? You keep the money. I want my leg back. Mr. Jones, I wish I had that power. I don't. All I can do is give you this money. Yeah, great. Well, I left as fast as I could. What can you say? Nothing you can do. Now, th that's the real dilemma. Then you confront, and then we'll take some questions, then you confront the problem of a collective remedy. You know, when you go to court in L New Orleans because you fell off a ladder or you got hit by an automobile, it's you versus the defendant. One-on-one. -on -one. In the 9-11 fund and all of these programs, it's not just one-on-one. -on -one. It's a collective group of eligible claimants. Now, here's what you learn when you try and compensate individuals in a group. It's not only a challenge to decide how much an individual is going to get. 
That's not that hard. It really isn't. Judges and juries every day in New Orleans decide how much you should pay somebody. Economic loss plus non-economic loss, add it up. Pain and suffering, tort one. It's not so hard. The problem becomes, not only when you've got to find out what each person's going to get, but everybody in a collective group, everybody counts other people's money. Now, if you don't think that's a challenge, requiring a shrink, Mr. Feinberg, you're going to give me $4 million tax-free. You're giving... My husband died. He was a fireman. He was a hero on 9-11. And you're giving my next-door neighbor, whose, uh, whose wife was a banker working for Enron, $5 million. What do you have against my husband? You never even met my husband. And you're giving me a million dollars less? How is that fair? You never even met him. Well, Mrs. Jones, it has nothing to do with fair. I mean, it is economic loss. Tort one at Tulane. I mean, your husband was a fireman. He wasn't earning as much as the banker next door. You know how far that gets you? Nowhere. It gets you nowhere. What gibberish is this? All I know is you're giving me a million dollars less than my next door neighbor. And then Congress, in its infinite wisdom, says, I must deduct life insurance from the award. That isn't tort one, is it? That's not torts. Economic loss plus non-economic loss minus life insurance. Mr. Feinberg, let me make sure I understand this. I'm, I would get $4 million, but because my husband and I had $1 million of life insurance, you're going to give me $3 million. My next-door neighbor's going to get $4 million, but instead of buying life insurance, they went to Vegas with the premium money. So they're getting $4 million. What do you have against us? You're penalizing us for sound financial planning. Well, Mrs. Jones, Congress said that, oh, that's really helpful, what Congress said. I mean, that's the problem, you see. That's why these, pro these, I mean, some people, if you deduct their life insurance, they owe me money from the fund. Fortunately, I had discretion to try and build it up to attract them into the fund. But you see the problem here. You see the problem with these programs. You've got to be careful here with the idea that these programs are somehow the wave of the future. Spare me. These programs are a wave of nothing. They can't be. And for all of you who have studied administrative law at Tulane, I mean, I must say, what do you think about the idea of delegating to one person all of this authority to calculate, to determine eligibility, to require a release, to determine what you're going to get? No committees, no appeals, no checks and balances. On, on grounds of efficiency, speed, and certainty, let's send it all to Feinberg, and he'll decide. Let me tell you something. That's not good political science. One of these days, there'll be an assignment that'll get out completely screwed up, and people will realize it's not a good idea to delegate to one person all of this unfettered discretion to decide who gets what. Now, if you don't like it, thank goodness, well, go sue. In other words, it's a free preview. If the administrator really isn't up to the task and we don't like the result, we can go litigate. Well, good luck if you want to go litigate. But when you raise people's expectations and you say, come on in, and take the money in 90 days, 60 days. Or do you want to litigate for five years with your lawyer? That's the alternative. Well, everybody wants to come in. And everybody wants to participate. But when lawyers say to me, this is a threat. These programs are a threat to the legal system that we study all the time in law school. These programs are no threat. You think that the tort system is somehow going to be modified or changed in order to provide more of these types of programs? You're tilting at windmills if you think that. First of all, I think the tort system works pretty well in this country, if you want to know the truth. 
I mean, it works pretty well every day in every court, in every city and village in the country. It works. Oh, mass torts are a problem, but all right, so mass torts are a problem. There are ways to deal with that. But the tort system works pretty well. And even if you think it doesn't, don't waste your time. The tort system is so ingrained in the history of this country. The idea that there's going to be some massive change to the way we go about compensating people, forget it. Forget it. Only 94 people in 9-11 decided to litigate. Everybody else came in, death cases. Everybody else came into the fund. 94 people, they all settled their case five years later. There was never a trial on 9-11. There never will be. So that's sort of the, 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 it would have been 50 minutes, but there were 15 minutes of introductions. We could have said a little bit more. But we still have about 10 minutes for questions, and since it's Tulane... I don't think there's any question, but that we'll have some good questions, not that I want to put pressure on anybody. So thank you very much, and let's throw it open. Yes, sir. I wonder if you could say more about why you still think it was the right thing to do. Uh, As I hear uh, you talk, you clearly are sufficiently uneasy about the program. What what sort of factors were you thinking about when you said it was still the right thing to do? Not from the perspective of the victims, from the perspective of the country. The American people, acting through their elected representatives, wanted to show the world, you can attack us from abroad, we take care of our own. When it comes to 9-11, we are one community from shore to shore, and we are going to show the world not only with the fist as we chase Al-Qaeda, But we will show the open, compassionate hand. We will show the world that when you attack us with a sneak attack, we as a people rally around the victims. This was important from the country's perspective, not from the victims. I can't justify a a, a program like this from the victim's perspective. From the country's perspective, 9-11, what is it, rivaled only in American history by the Civil War, Pearl Harbor, the assassination of President Kennedy. That's it. That's it. This is a one-off. And I think from that, that perspective, it made a lot of sense. Yes, sir. In your opinion, how much did BP spend uh, in, in, the, in the fund over what they would have paid out in a, in a reasonable, more typical court situation? Well, I can't answer that because I'm not privy to what they spent in resolving the class action after I left. Don't forget, all I did was, for 16 months, pay uh, 223,000 businesses and individuals. So I don't know, six and a half billion, I don't know what the alternative would be if they had litigated those six and a half billion. Uh, I tend to think it would have been a lot, lot higher in terms of administrative savings by going through this system and resolving these claims. But I don't know exactly. That's an interesting question. That one day, BP's a public company, that may all come out. I don't know right now, though. Yes, sir. I'm just curious, given, given the reservations that you've expressed about these programs, why you continue to accept the appointments to head them up? <laughs> well, first of all, let's distinguish the programs. The, the gift programs that aren't alternatives to the tort system that are designed to dispense private donated money to victims, that's a, that's a compassionate, charitable thing to do. I don't want to get paid for that. Like, like millions of Americans would do the same thing. Here's uh, $61 million from 100,000 people. Give it away to the 240 people who were killed or injured in the Boston Marathon bombings. I think that's a, I'm glad to do that. It's complicated. It's not as complicated as the tort system, but it's complicated. But I'm glad to do that. Now, as to 9-11 and BP, why do I do it? Well, you may say... When President Bush or President Obama ask you to do it, no, I'm busy. What do you? I mean, <laughs> you, it's the President of the United States. You know, um, you 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 step up. I mean, you're a public citizen. 
Your country wants you to do this. GM, GM asked me to do it after Congress said, we expect you to come up with a viable alternative uh, make, no, and not make these people sue. Ken, would you do this? Of course I'll do this. You would do it. You would do it. You probably could do it if you were a student here at Tulane. So, I mean, it's not something that you, uh, you can easily not do. But when you take it on, like I say, brace yourself because it's not the substance that's so hard. It's the psychological debilitating part of the thing that makes it tough, really. But you get some satisfaction, you see, in doing it. You get some satisfaction, not only when the president thanks you. President Obama called me, thanked me, and invited my whole family, my wife and my whole family, to come to see him in the Oval Office, my, my, my children. Um, uh, it, was fa- I mean, it was just a wonderful day. We'll, you know, we'll all remember it forever. And he just said to the whole family, he said, I just want you to know what your father did was extraordinary, and we're, we as a people... As a nation, are very grateful. Well, that makes it worthwhile. So, is there any contemplation in a 9/11 occurrence that as an act of war, if it was officially classified as that, I don't know if it was, that it would be precedent setting to compensate civilians against an act of war? I don't think the United States government ever declared it to be an act of war. And I'll tell you something else about 9/11. <laughs> The United States never apologized to any family for what happened on 9-11. These, this 9-11 program was most certainly not reparations. This was not government money offered to the victims with an apology from the United States. We're sorry it happened. <laughs> to this day... Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, there's been no apology from the United States government. And, and reparations where a government apologizes and pays money with an apology. In American history, you can put that on one hand. The last... The last reparations program I'm aware of, where the government, acting through the President of the United States, said, we are sorry, was in 1980, you'll remember, when President Reagan apologized to the, uh, to the, um, the, the families of Japanese-American citizens interned after Pearl Harbor on the West Coast. And President Reagan and Congress gave every family $20,000, not $2 million, and said, we are sorry what we did to your family. But that is so rare, and the government never uh, declared 9-11 to be an act of war or anything like that. It was a sneak, dastardly, terrorist attack without a known country responsible. Yes, sir. I think it's wonderful. I think if FEMA is willing to open up, not because one person or a hundred people think that way, but I think you said 140,000 people think that way, I think it's a fabulous thing to do. And maybe they'll, maybe they'll change their, uh, the, the view of what was done back then. Well, 9-11 we paid in 33 months direct cash compensation as an alternative to the tort system, $7.1 billion. FEMA, maybe even more than that, but that money isn't an alternative to litigation. That FEMA money, I'll be surprised if FEMA will pay checks to 140,000 individuals as opposed to some communities or a review of how the money was denied or spent by the community for sewerage or or electricity or whatever. I mean, it may be that individuals will get FEMA money, but I don't think FEMA's in the habit of paying individuals 140,000 claims. Yeah.
I guess, administer that process? FEMA? I don't know. I mean, it all depends. FEMA, in some administrations, going back to President Clinton, has a pretty impressive record. Pretty impressive. Don't automatically poo-poo FEMA. They've had some bad situations in this area, but but I don't know how FEMA plans to do it. A special task force, a special master with the court's help. FEMA appoints somebody to design that. I mean, they'll figure out a way, I'm sure. Let's take two more. Yes, ma'am. Julie. You said there were 94 litigated. What was the outcome in, in comparison to what they would have done if they were well, I get that asked all the time. I don't know. I mean, that was sealed. You don't know. It was sealed by the court. You're not sure. I suspect some people got more. Some people got less than what I paid for a similar case. But the people who got more, don't forget, 25% goes to your attorney off the top. And, you know, you waited five years. The time value of money when interest rates mattered then, I guess. And that, and, um, um, you know, you're living with it for five years. There's an existential component to this. Get the money, move on as best you can. I'd say that with some uh, superficiality. I, it's not, you know, how do you ever move on? But, but you do the best you can without reliving it every day in the courtroom. Last question. Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Let me give you two final examples to bring this to a close. In the 9-11 fund, there were two people out of 7,300 claims, two, who did nothing. They didn't take the money that I offered them, nor did they sue. They let the time expire, the statute of limitations. They did nothing. Now, I went and visited both. One was a priest. I said, Father, you lost your brother. You're going to get about $2.2 million. You only have another two weeks under the program to file. File. No, it's God's will. Spare me God's will. Let me tell you something. Take the $2.2 million. Give it a Catholic charity. Set up an endowed fund in your brother's name. Never did anything. Never did anything. The other lady was 84 years old in Brooklyn, and she lost her son. And I went to see her two weeks before the program expired because I could see she's the only one left that hadn't filed a claim. And the priest. And, and her. I went to her home in Brooklyn, Mrs. Jones. You're going to get $3.8 million. Now, I'll help you. I brought the claim form. Just sign it, and I'll help you fill it out. She goes, Mr. Feinberg, I lost my son, and you're here to talk to me about money? Leave that application on the kitchen table. I'll think about it. She never filed. You learn that grief can paralyze people. Paralyze them so they don't do the right thing. And I close this lecture with this story. Of all the claims I've ever received in any program, one will stay with me forever. A lady came in to see me in the 9-11 fund. Get this. And she says to me, Mr. Feinberg, I lost my husband at the World Trade Center, and I want to know, you say I'm going to get $3 million. Am I going to get it no matter what I say at this hearing? <laughs> I go, yeah. It, uh, your, this hearing is voluntary. Anything, you, as long as it's not fraud, anything you say won't be used in any way. You're getting $3 million. She goes, all right, as long as I know that. My husband was scum. I can, I'm so glad. I'm so glad he's gone. I'm getting my... I'm, now I'm getting justice. For years, this guy tormented me. And now I'm getting three million. He's better off dead than he ever was alive. And I thank you very much for this hearing. And she walked out a happy lady. So you never know what you're going to hear. Thank you all very much. And thank you, Tulane.